plenary and we've had the opportunity to meet some wonderful people from the UK who came all this way to be with us today to share their understanding and knowledge and expertise um, on universal health visiting. So we're super excited to have them here with us today. This plenary will present an overview of the health visiting system in the UK. Uh, a model, a universal model that is available to all families and young children. Our, our distinguished presenters will give an overview of what that looks like in their country. And then we're super excited to have Deb Darrow wrap us up with a reflection on what this might look like in the United States. So let me do a quick round of introductions and then I'll turn it over to John as the moderator. So our panelists today are John, John Korfmacher, Associate Professor at the Erickson Institute, Dr. Cheryl Adams, Founder and Executive Director of the Institute of Health Visiting, Dr. Karen Whitaker, Associate Professor of Child and Family Health at the University of Central Lancashire, and of course, Deb Darrow, Senior Researcher, Senior Research Fellow at Chapin Hall at University of Chicago. So please extend a warm welcome to our guests and give them your attention. Excuse me. Oh, my mic already works. Oh, the picture does not work. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Or, as they say in England, good afternoon. <laughs> Did you think I was going to say cheerio or something like that? I don't traffic in stereotypes like that. It is my great pleasure to be here introducing my colleagues from across the pond. Uh, it's my greater pleasure to be able to work the phrase across the pond into this introduction. I'm very grateful to the ounce that we were able to send you off, we're able to send you off from a pretty fantastic summit with a presentation about what we can learn from home visiting systems in other parts of the world. Who was here uh, for the summit last year? Just old school polling, raise your hands. Nice. Um, one year ago at the summit, I was um, also fortunate to participate in a plenary developed by Joan Lombardi where we introduced you to examples of home visiting programming across different parts of the globe. There were two reasons why we did this. One is to recognize that we are not alone. Home visiting can sometimes be a lonely field for the visitors, um, the researchers, and others who support it. So how often do you have to explain to other people what you do? Right? And how often do people look at you after you give them the explanation, smile and say, okay, <laughs> like they got it, uh, but they probably don't really. Hopefully, increasingly, this is less so, but still. So it might be lonely, but you are not alone. All over the world, there are hundreds of thousands of people doing what you do. They celebrate the same victories, little and small, that home visitors here celebrate when something's going right with the family. And they struggle with many of the same challenges that home visitors here struggle with when a family won't answer the door, when funding gets frozen because of government uh, budget drama, or when they're asked to fill out yet another piece of paperwork that someone besides them thought was necessary. One of the great joys of my professional life has been realizing that there are people halfway across the globe interested in the same things that I am interested in and are passionate about exploring uh, ways to support young families and to make that support more effective. The second reason to focus on international home visiting efforts is to open our eyes to different possibilities of how to do what we do. So this is where I go into TED Talk mode, and, uh, and I say, what if I were to tell you? Or imagine a world where. So picture a land. 
where every family with a baby has the possibility of a supportive visitor who comes at key moments in development across time. And this service is accepted as a profession and integrated into the service system. And you would say, what magical fantasy kingdom is this? And I would say not a fantasy kingdom, but it does have castles and a queen and some princesses, <laughs> although one of them used to be an American television star and people seem to be a little bit flustered by that. I would also say not a fantasy kingdom because England, that's the country I'm talking about, has its own challenges in implementing and supporting what they call their health visitors, as our speakers will acknowledge. So it is not a home visiting land of milk and honey, but it still has many lessons for us. So we are back again with another international presentation, and I hope this becomes a regular feature. About six years ago, I was invited to participate in a technical advisory group for UNICEF that's focused on developing home visiting programming in Central Europe and Asia. And in my first meeting, I was invited to talk about what we have accomplished here in the US and what curricula and models the task force may want to consider promoting. And uh, well, while I was doing this, a pediatric leader of early childhood from Australia interrupted me and said, but you don't offer home visiting to everybody. You only give it to some people. What's the point of that? And in that moment, marshalling all my knowledge and expertise, I reared up and my best defense was, I'm rubber, you're glue. <laughs> Whatever you say bounces off me and onto you. What that exchange, really wasn't an exchange, I didn't really say that. Um, what this exchange suddenly highlighted to me was that there were unfortunately two competing approaches to providing home visiting support. One approach is targeted home visiting focused on families who meet certain risk categories and are considered more in need, which is what we primarily do here in the US. And the other is universal models that don't use risk-based criteria and are, opened in, and are open and they're offered to everyone. This is the approach that is promoted largely in the United Kingdom and you can see in other countries that have a larger community health worker or public health nurse workforce. And I say this comparison, this competition is unfortunate because it does not need to be either or. There is a third way, the universal progressive approach AKA the universal pragmatic approach, AKA the universal proportionate approach. We haven't settled on the name yet. Um, this approach allows for the intersection of services available for all with additional services for those who need it. And I am glad my colleagues will talk about how this issue is approached in the UK and that our discussant will help us think about what this could look like in the US. So I'm gonna make one more point briefly before I turn over the plenary to my colleagues. Yesterday, Ann Duggan and her panel made an impassioned call for precision home visiting. This is the big idea that HARC promotes, fine tuning home visiting services to help us better understand what works best for whom. So maybe it feels like a bit of whiplash to say yes to precision home visiting and then turn around and say yes to universal home visiting an approach that delivers roughly the same services to all families. And it's okay if it seems a little confusing. The very smart Robert Ammerman noted yesterday in a workshop that the precision home visiting approach has muddled his thinking, but in a good way, which immediately went up as on Twitter as a t-shirt idea but it means that we are thinking harder about these issues. And when we think harder about these issues, it can, it can start to feel complex. F. Scott Fitzgerald once said that the sign of an intelligent mind is being able to hold two contradictory ideas in your head at the same time. So, can we have universal home visiting and precision home visiting? 
I say yes, and I leave it to the panel to show us how this is not actually a contradiction. All right, so the UNICEF Technical Advisory Group was revelatory for a second reason, because it is where I met my two colleagues, whom I shall now introduce and get out of the way from. Dr. Cheryl Adams is the founding director of the Institute of Health Visiting, a UK-wide academic and professional body for health visitors that drives leadership and service improvement in health visiting. She has over 20 years experience as a national strategic leader for health visiting and was herself a health visitor for many years. In 2006, Dr. Adams was awarded the title of Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire by the Queen, you know which one, <laughs> for her service to health visiting. Dr. Karen Whitaker is on the faculty of the School of Nursing as a reader in child and family health at the University of Central Lancashire. She leads the child and family health research theme group referred to as SEARCH, supporting evaluation and research in child and family health. She also has previous experience as a health visitor. She's contributed considerably to the body of health visiting research, and she provides training internationally on home visiting. Finally, our discussant is Dr. Deborah Darrow, who barely needs an introduction by now. Dr. Darrow has played a key role in the development and assessment of evidence-based home visiting programs for the past 30 years. She's a current member of the leadership team of HART and is a senior research fellow at Chapin Hall in Chicago. She has received so many awards and uh, recognition that I don't know where to begin, so I won't. <laughs> Thank you, and before we start, we are doing a one last internet poll. So, pull out your phones, you technophobes. Let's do this. Oh. What opportunities do universal service open up? Oh, I love this horse race. Who's going to win? So far, tackling stigmas in the front. Shifting the social gradients, coming up from behind. Making the invisible visible. Making a run for its money. Oh. Excellent. All right. With that, thank you. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Adams to begin, followed by Dr. Whitaker and Dr. Darrow. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> so exciting to be here with you and actually to be in an audience of people who understand my world, really. Um, I've just been so impressed by all that I've heard over the last few days and particularly how you flex your services for different groups and different needs, which is what we do too. We don't always do as successfully as we'd like to and I think we've got an awful lot of learning from some of the um, presenters, certainly, that I've heard over the last few days. Before I start, I'd just like to say a thank you to John for bringing us here, and a thank you to the ANTS organization for making this possible. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity. We really hope, as a result of this, we'll start more discussion um, across the pond. Now, I'm just going to put my watch on, and uh, off we go. So, what I'm going to do is to give you some background to health visiting. I'm going to talk about... Um, the necessary things that need to be in place for health visiting, a universal health visiting service to be successful. And then Karen will pick up and she will talk more about the research about, around the universal model. Um, so what is a health visitor? Well, they're a nurse or they're a midwife and then they have additional training in public health to become a health visitor. Somebody said to me shortly after we arrived, oh, we haven't had health visitors for long, have you? They actually date back to ladies sanitary inspectors in, in 1862. So <laughs> we have had health visitors for a long time. And what's happened is that over the, cent well, over the, the years, the model has been refined, it's adapted. The first health visitors were obviously dealing with overcrowding, with maternal child death, poor nutrition, um, infectious disease. Today, we're obviously dealing with some of the diseases of modern life, mental illness, obesity. Um, and sadly, 
speech and language and communication issues, which has become quite a priority in the UK. Um, we're very fortunate because we have a national health service. We can also have a national universal health system service. Um, so who gets the universal service? It's literally available to every single family, every single baby born in the UK, whether you're the Duchess of Cambridge or, or who you are, you would be offered the service. And it's very, very few mothers who wouldn't accept the service, virtually none, in fact. And I think you all know, probably many of you are parents, you know, just how wonderful to have a bit of additional support in those crucial early days, particularly with your first baby. Um, so, oh, I've just, I've just put one slide in about the Institute, and I've done that because I think probably many of our resources could be of value to you. We do have international membership, and I've put some flyers out on the tables. But what we're there to do really is to raise the bar in health system. We're an academic body. Um, we want health systems to be doing it better. We want to improve the research base. We focus on education, quality assurance, leadership, which is very important. Um, working in partnership, something else that's very important. Um, research, yes, well, that's pretty much it. I think I can't remember which one I've missed. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, but we also have a conspicuous social media presence. So do follow us on Twitter. We use Twitter to get evidence out. So every day, any new evidence that's published will be tweeted. So if you follow us on Twitter, you'll get a constant flow of, of what, not only what's going on in the Institute, but probably much more about evidence, new policy and so on, which may be of of interest and then we have a Facebook group and the Facebook groups somewhat more interesting as you can imagine sometimes we get some quite heated debates about certain issues in the UK so what's the basis of health visiting and how health visitors operate well we have four principles they date back to 1977 so they're over 40 years old they've stood the test of time they under underpin the training um, and the standards for health visiting practice, and they very much underpin the philosophy of health visiting and how, vi how health visitors make decisions and how they operate with every family. First of all, the search of, for health needs, and this will be very familiar with you. Um, obviously, if you don't know what the needs are, you can't respond to them, so that's very obvious. Um, once you've found a need, you need to do something about it, so stimulation of health needs, talking to the family about what in your views might be um, a priority need. It may not be their priority need, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, but making, <coughs> creating an awareness of needs. And obviously that's also about creating an awareness of needs maybe with the family doctor um, and with other community workers. The facilitation, of this can seem very simple, <laughs> but it's actually really important because it provides a process. Um, the facilitation of health enhancing activities. So. Um, working with alongside the family, we work alongside the families, we don't tell them what to do, and I think that's probably something that's very comfortable with you too. Um, but then to work out, well, what would be the best way forward to support this particular family? Um, and then the fourth um, principle, which will be much less familiar perhaps, the influence on policies affecting health. And for me, this is probably one of the things that's kept me in health visiting. Working with families and at an individual level is really important, but there are times when working actually at a community level or even a government level may be more powerful. And health visitors traditionally have had something of a lobbying role. It might be lobbying to get a new clinic set up um, or to create a new service locally. Um, but we've had examples of health visitors even turning around sink estates, getting everybody together, the police and so on, where there's a lot of crime to see how they could actually improve the health of the people living in that, those populations. So I think that's the interesting one, and I'll just come back to that a little bit in a minute. Um, I like this slide because it demonstrates the different types of need. Um, health visitors will work with population level need. Well, what are the breastfeeding figures? What's the epidemiology of this population? What needs to be done? Conspicuous need. Um, the need that's assessed by the health visitor himself, but also um, the need that the family express, and this of course is really important, because if the mother's really concerned about something, whatever reason you went in to see that, that mother with may actually have to go out of the window and you may have to focus on something completely different and to help her sort that out. And then how does the health visitor respond? Well, again, probably not dissimilar to you. Um, she may provide a sole service, she also works with a team, she may involve a team member. 
She may refer or delegate to um, another team member. She may engage the family with the voluntary sector, or she may refer on to specialist services. So <clears throat> this is our so-called 456 model. It's actually uh, just about to be revamped, but I think it's quite helpful in just demonstrating, um, and it was deliberately designed to demonstrate what do health visitors do. Um, because, you know, as John's just said, you try and explain what you do, and, and you know, sometimes there's a little bit of glazing over. So we work at four levels, and I've talked to you about two of them, the community level um, and the individual level. So if we find need, we then talk about working at Universal Plus. So a mother's depressed, we work with her through that depression. So that's Universal Plus. It's usually a time-limited intervention. But Universal Partnership Plus, um, I just realized John's gone off of my notes. It's okay, I'm gonna read your case study. Um, University, Universal Partnership Plus is, um, when you need to, it's a much more chronic situation and you need to involve other people. Can I just, I think, I think you did. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna describe this with a case study. Um, so at a routine six to eight week, which is a standard point um, contact with Mary, a teacher, and I'm just making the point that this is a teacher, this isn't a so-called vulnerable family. The health sister assesses her for postnatal depression and attachment with her baby. She finds she's quite depressed. She also noticed that she seems somewhat disconnected from her baby. She gently probes to see if the reasons are clear, but they aren't obvious, except that she notices she doesn't seem to have any local friends um, or a local family to support her. So that's the universal level. She offers six weekly support and counseling sessions, um, which could be non-directive counseling, motivational interviewing, or CBT to manage her depression um, and to help her support, develop the relationship with the baby. The, the two things can obviously happen um, hand in hand. So that's Universal Plus, offering a little more support. During those contacts, it becomes clear that she's socially isolated, but also that her much loved father died a few weeks before the baby was born. Also that her relationship with her, uh, the baby's father is rocky, something that, as we all know, relationships are everything. Um, and this can happen um, where, where, where one things go wrong with one person, they can start to go wrong with, with the whole network around the family, or, or the whole family, sorry. Um, so the health sister suggests that she might find bereavement counseling helpful and organizes it for her alongside her own visits. So that would be Universal Partnership Plus, starting to bring other people in. She also suggests that her partner might find it useful to talk to friends or work colleagues about the challenges of early parenthood. She also introduces her to a Ready Steady Mums group where she can make friends. So that's operating then at a community level. Um, when she follows up with a second assessment six weeks later, what she finds is the mother seems to be coping better. She says her relationship with her husband is improving. He has talked to friends and he now better understands her needs and is supporting her. So as you can see, there's these four levels, but they happen naturally. We don't really talk about them. Although with, I'd better be careful using this word commissioners. Um, let's just say with, um, with managers, it may be necessary to actually demonstrate why you're putting extra time in. So to articulate while I'm going into the universal plus and partnership plus level. Um, sorry. Okay. So the five mandated elements, um, in Scotland, it's 12. In Wales, it's nine. In Northern Ireland, it's eight. We got brought down to five, which were um, mandated three years ago. It hasn't been a great thing for families. It's not enough, nothing like enough, because health systems should actually be autonomous. They need to decide how much each family needs. There are certain touch points, um, but one of the crucial ones, which is missing with, with this current um, <coughs> service, is three to four months obviously at three to four months is a great time to assess the mother's mental health, but also to talk about um, weaning, potentially, to talk about the baby starting to food and being more vulnerable. But the, the checks we've got are an antenatal check, a new birth baby check, um, review of the baby and the mum, six to eight weeks check, which is a mental health check, as well as reviewing the baby's development, a one year assessment of the baby and a two to two and a half year assessment of the baby. The antenatal check is probably the most important one. That's when you build the relationship with the family. 
and you have an opportunity to talk to the family, and we're beginning to do more of this, but we need to do much more about what their childhood was like, what they're bringing into this new family, how would they like to do it differently, what did they not like about the discipline that their parents used, and, and how might they change things for this baby. And then quickly, the six high impact areas, and these are areas where there's obviously an evidence base that health systems can make a difference. Sorry. Um, okay, and that slide, and you've got these slides, really just demonstrates the difference across the UK in the number of contacts. So what needs to be in place to set up a robust health visiting service? Um, well, first of all, you need um, a framework for practice. And we have something called the Healthy Child Programme. It's 10 years old. It's also about to be refreshed um, and hopefully turned into a, a document with even more teeth. It's a public document. Parents have a right to say, well, this is the programme. Um, I'm not getting all of this. They don't because nobody tells them they can, but they could do in principle. Um, and our Healthy Child Programme goes from pregnancy to 19 um, and is a really health, helpful evidence-based document. It also has these three different layers. So what should the universal service be delivering and what are the sort of step up and, and what should the most vulnerable families be receiving? So as you can see, it's not about everybody getting the same. It's about assessing need and based on that need, the services are delivered according to what those families need. Um, and this just refers you to one paper. The reason we put this in is that Professor Dame Sarah Cowley, health visiting has a dame, um, <coughs> is our sort of guru. She's our Deb Darrow of, of health visiting. And it's just such a shame that you don't have dame hoods here because I'm sure you'd have one sitting at the end there. <laughs> um, so establishing a successful service, what are the important factors? Well, really important, and I'm sure this will chime with you, is actually recruiting the right people with the right attributes. It's not everybody who can go into fa families. It's not everybody who can work with um, a caseload, knock on the door, and not know what they're going to find behind it. These take special people, so you have to recruit very carefully. Um, obviously, comprehensive education and training, and the Institute's working really hard to try and standardize that more across the UK. At the moment, there's some variation, and we don't feel that that's um, acceptable. I mean, every baby deserves the same quality of care. Um, Evidence-based structures to call on, universality we've talked about, ecological context. And I think you all work in an ecological context, and I hope you know that's a term that would, you'd feel familiar with. You're working with a family in their environment, and you're trying to address the services to their particular needs. Sufficient access, sufficient home visits to build a relationship. Um, and then come back to this word, relationship. For us, the relationship building is absolutely critical. They've got one or two slightly crazy models they've introduced in some areas of England to try to save money where there isn't continuity of care. There's a team approach and different people get sent. And my, my daughter-in-law has a baby that's five months. She saw the health visitor, didn't see one antenatal because they were short staffed, saw one at, at two weeks, but was then told, well, it probably won't be me next time. Well, that's not great for her. And it's certainly not great for the professional either because it's, you know, you're not building the relationship. And you can do so much more um, if you have that relationship. You know, as we know, mental illness, domestic violence, substance abuse, these things aren't conspicuous, but they can affect any family. So it's just so important to have the opportunity, and good health visiting is based on having that relationship. So the parents actually trust you, and they can tell you that they have got, are having a really rocky time with their husband, and they'd like some help. But you're not going to tell a stranger that really focus on that word relationship but I know that chimes with you and many of you are in a privileged position of being part of programs with um, a lot of opportunity to build relationships over time. Professional autonomy um, so you can make the decisions with the families. Um, public health and client outcomes. Now I'm not going to go into that and you can look at the slides but this is the basis for a new curriculum we're about to publish. The triangle at the top left is the attributes and as you can see there are nine squares there really nine triangles, really important to have all of those. The ones on the right are the skills that health visitors need and the ones at the bottom are the learning that they need to have. So the, in terms of the education, health visitors, as I've said, are nurses or midwives. They then do a one-year training at degree or a little longer at master's level. About a third of health visitors are master's level. They're regulated by the Nursing and Midwifery Council and their training is based on those four domains. 
Um, <coughs> so health systems sits in a really complex, complex system. And however good it may be and however hard we work at the Institute to get it right with health visitors, unfortunately, them up there um, can, can interfere, can't they? So what matters there? Well, obviously, a highly trained and committed workforce, but you then need a good policy plan properly financed. And one of the problems in England at the moment and why we've got less contacts is that some bright spark of a minister decided to take some money out of the public health budget, not realising what the impact of that would be on health visiting. Um, it takes five years before our ministers will come up with a new policy, unfortunately, but hopefully this is going to be the year we'll, we'll hear about what's going to happen next. Professional standards and regulation I've touched on, educational progress, but a lot of post-grad um, post community, um, community development, sorry, sorry, CPD, <laughs> continuous professional development is, is really important because there's so many skills that you, you need to learn. But then an accommodating um, system. If you have a manager who isn't a health visitor, things often can go wrong. You know, it's an unusual world, the world of health visiting, and it's really helpful to have managers that understand that. Um, so what's the research told us about successful health visiting? And this is research which Karen was involved in about five years ago, that it's salutogenic, health creating, that it demonstrates a positive regard for others, human valuing, that it recognizes a person in their ecological situation. And then that there are four core practices for successful service delivery, home visiting, relationships, needs assessment, and actually also having access to doing things in the community for families. And what happens, what, what, what matters to the workforce? You know, why do they get out of bed in the morning? Why would they, they go to work? And again, this is a piece of work which Karen actually, which led, um, Karen led. Um, why do they go to work? Well, what they like to keep them in the job is new opportunities, becoming the breastfeeding lead, the mental health lead, and so on. The opportunity for further study, um, the opportunity for promotion, obviously, but also to be able to work out solutions, to have the time to be true to their principles, um, the support of inspirational leaders, working with human resource, capitalizing on technology. They're not really good on technology yet, but, uh, but they like to have a sense of control. And these are some comments from one person that she interviewed, and I'm gonna go back to my notes because it's not quite so clear there. So what matters to her? Well, being a lone worker, being able to work autonomous, autonomously and organize her day with some built-in constraints such as clinics, obviously, working with GP practices, with good liaison links and good interprofessional working with children's center staff, knowing her caseload, absolutely crucial, good continuity of care, so she's fortunate enough to be able to build relationships. So I'm gonna just leave it on that note, and unfortunately, this is what we're dealing with at the moment in England. It's completely the opposite picture in the other three parts of the UK. The graph is still going up, um, but just so important to be able to influence at a policy level so these silly mistakes are not made in the future. I'm gonna hand over to Karen with the evidence. Good afternoon, I should say. <laughs> I'd like to echo what Cheryl um, said earlier and thank you very much for welcoming, welcoming us so warmly to your conference. It's been a real privilege to, to meet so many people and to talk about home visiting in, in such an invigorating way. So Cheryl has set out what health visiting is, how we operate, who we are. It's my job now to try and explain how we operate in a universal way, so here we go. So what's our rationale for a universal approach? I'm not going to go through all the detail in this slide, but it's really just to flag up and remind ourselves that ultimately we're concerned with the health inequalities that exist within our countries, within your country, within our, our own country, but actually globally as well. There are health inequalities between countries within countries. The reason that's a problem is because it makes us feel a bit uncomfortable, yeah? It's a social justice issue, surely. And we also know that acting on health inequalities makes good economic sense. We could make um, not only our lives fairer, but actually do, our, do everybody a lot of good. Coupled 
with that, over, the ta over recent time, there's been increasing evidence about investing in early childhood, investing in life at the beginning, and it will win us dividends later on. And uh, so much so, the, this growing evidence base, that the WHO is now also giving real attention to early life and the need for universal approaches. And they, they did this by re relaunching their primary health care document, which was actually a, a revisit to the um, Alma Ata declaration that, was, that came some 30 years previously. So all this attention opens up the doors for thinking about universalism, but also thinking about it in a proportionate way. The challenge is that needs uh, aren't just one thing. They exist across a gradient and they vary. They vary both in intensity and um, experience of them or type. Fortunately, what we do know is that if we can target problems and um, you know, give more resource and attention to those problems, we can uh, win good results. And we have an, a good evidence base for that. And certainly in the UK, we are constantly drawing on a lot of your American evidence for that. The other issue, though, is that there is a population distribution of need. And most of the cases of the need often sit outside select that selected group that's being targeted. So this is a challenge. Indeed, there's a paradox going on. The paradox is that a large number of people at small risk may give rise to more cases of disease than the small number of people with high risk. Essentially, the high risk groups make up a relatively small proportion of the population. So what we have is if we concentrate our efforts just on the high risk people, we will always be missing a large number of the population. So what we, what we try to do um, in the UK is deliver a service system that is trying to flatten this humped curve, trying to shift our resources and, um, and, and deliver more energy across the whole population. Not easy, though. In brief, what it looks like is uh, something similar to this. So the green blocks represent health sitting. The dark green, you could consider the one-to-one -one approach. So there's a universal action, which means everybody is getting something but there is capacity to give more when, when need is greater and circumstances change. But it also operates as part of a wider service system, so there are other community resources at play as well that uh, complement the, the work of the health visitor. So we describe that as a service, but in addition to that, we have programs. And uh, indeed, we have um, a program that we refer to as FNP, you refer to as Nurse Family Partnership. It's, uh, we had to give it another name <laughs> just to confuse things. Um, but we also have another program called MESH in operation. I'll mention that a little later. So what we're aiming for is to deliver what Michael Marmot referred to as a proportionate universal service. And he particularly highlighted in his strategic review of health inequalities in England this challenge of um, needing to give every child the best start in life. And, and if we don't do that, we'll never address health inequalities. So let's just think a little bit more about this proportionate universalism idea. And I'm going to, uh, I realize I've gotten full flow, so I've forgotten to look at where I'm at. So I'm going to remind myself so I don't get stuck here. So we've got a series of topics which I'm going to briefly draw on. So the first is needs. Um, the second I'll look at uh, briefly is uh, evidence around life course. Remind ourselves then about the practice of health visiting and I've put tailoring there as a one way of trying to sum it up because it's certainly a key feature as part of that relationship. And then lastly, thinking about investment. So first of all, if you think about need and what evidence do we um, draw on 
to support the Healthy Child Programme that Cheryl mentioned. Uh, the, the, there are a series of um, government-supported documents that actually build on systematic reviews, and there's uh, a couple of them shown here, published alongside the Healthy Child Programme that was originally pu published um, back in 2008. And then that was updated in 2015. So that's the first two documents. We also have another body, which is called the um, Early Intervention Foundation. And it looks at specific um, aspects of early life. Um, both sets of documents, uh, or each set of documents, take a slightly different approach to looking at evidence. So we always need to be remind, reminded of the fact that um, that actually sometimes all evidence doesn't appear equal. So this is evidence which is generated to support the ideas around what practices should we be um, trying out, investing, and using if we're going to tackle uh, the different health challenges that can come up as we meet families. But we also have evidence which is generated to inform policy. And um, I'll just flag this particular document up. This is the, one of the most recent reports which was submitted to the Health Select Committee. It's a science and technology committee. And one of the features that they particularly raised was this concern for adverse childhood events. We're, we're a bit of a lag behind yourselves. Um, there's been lots of talk of ACEs here, which is really pleasing to see, and we're, we're only just sort of starting to get to grips with that in the UK. Um, but I also mentioned this document because uh, within this document they acknowledged and used, made use of evidence that was prepared by the Institute of Health Visiting, which pointed out the discrepancy in workforce numbers across the country and the challenges, the very real challenges that we face in order to deliver a universal service if we don't actually have the numbers of practitioners to deliver that 456 model. So, um, moving on and thinking about life course, uh, now we've had some excellent speakers across the, the last couple of days, and um, so I'm not going to revisit the, the science of early life. So, uh, needless to say, there is the Lancet series, which provides some fantastic evidence, and uh, it's been crystallized to some extent by the WHO in the publication of their nurturing care framework. And of course, that brings together the fact that um, uh, practices to support early life need to be centred around that nurturing environment and, um, and also in the context of the full range of family life, which is the home, the workplace, uh, the childcare setting, etc., in the community. So what about the practice of health visiting itself? So this is a piece of work that I was really privileged to be, to be a part of, um, led by uh, Dame Professor Sarah Cowley. It was a program of um, health visiting research, which was a rare thing, because the other thing we really struggle for is to get funding specifically for work into our area of practice. It was made up of three studies. The first was a review of the evidence, and we looked purposefully at the evidence in the UK um, to be so that we could be really clear that we were talking about health visiting rather than other variations of home visiting. And then it was supported by two empirical studies. One, which Cheryl has already referred to, was looking at the workforce experience of delivering their job and essentially asking that question, why do you stay? What drives you to be the health visitor that you are? What motivates you and inspires you about your practice? And then the third one, most importantly, was to ask the question of how is your experience of the health visiting service? What helps you in terms of, you know, in terms of what you receive from that service? And this, is course, was to the parents. Now, the interesting thing about this piece of work was, uh, Cheryl's already alluded to the fact, we identified this orientation to practice within the existing literature that was operationalized essentially by these three elements. And most importantly, relationships was at the top of that list. But it was about um, meeting people, seeing people in the safety and privacy of their own home. So entering into the family's own world and in being engaged continually in needs assessment. Now, when we also looked at the empirical evidence, and uh, this did surprise us to some extent, but I suppose we shouldn't have been too surprised. But 
The health visitors also talked about a respectful relationship, and that was about their relationship with the people that, are, that were managing their time and the, the rules and the boundaries within which they were working. They needed to be sufficiently flexible enough, in other words, respect their level of autonomy, so that they were able to make professional decis decisions that ultimately enabled them to tailor their practice to the need that was presented in front of them. And not surprisingly, the parents rated relationships as the critical feature. And again, it came back to time, time to listen, to hear, and to ensure that the practice and interventions that were delivered were appropriate to the need that they were experiencing. And if you want to read a little bit more about that work, there's um, a publication here and we have a reference list at the end. So the fourth point that we mentioned was investment. So ultimately, bottom line is always going to be cost, isn't it? And when push comes to shove um, and things get cut, it's often the invisible work that gets cut. We've often referred in the UK to health visiting being quite a Cinderella service. In fact, indeed, most community nursing services have been Cinderella services for a long time. The very fact that it's in the home makes it quite difficult to explain, as we've mentioned before. And its, it's visibility, of course, is, is hard to show as well. But nevertheless, we do have evidence for um, where, where health visitors have been working and looking at their practice and seeing, so, okay, so if we enhance their practice with some additional training to specifically address the um, mental health needs of women in the early postnatal period, what will we get? Well, we found that um, actually you get a response an experience with the, with the mother, which is very much improved than the control group that just has standard health visiting practice. And um, so the amount of resource that's required to meet the needs of the mothers when the health visitors have the additional training um, wins dividends. And this produced a cost saving in terms of the quality life adjusted years, um, of which equated to about $100 or so. And in addition to that, the training itself became cost neutral within six months. So it was, um, it, it, it's, it's one of very few studies, unfortunately, but nevertheless quite a powerful finding. It, we should also add that as part of our universal proportionate provision and the important role of the health is to be able to flex up and flex down in their service offer, the service is also complemented by other programs in some areas. And this is where we have a slightly different service going on in, uh, in different parts of the country. So we're also um, constantly drawing on specific examples of home visiting that, that are being delivered by models that have um, very good parallels with standard health visiting practice. So I mentioned um, the materni Maternal Early Childhood Sustained Home Visiting Program. Mesh, uh, of which um, Lynn Kemp is a lead developer and who is with us here today. So I'm sure you can catch Lynn um, in the break time. Uh, there's the Family Nurse Partnership, which has come, which is the Nurse Family Partnership, which we changed the name of. And uh, there's also a program called Starting Well, and that was delivered up in Scotland. Now that doesn't run anymore. Um, but that was so influential in terms of the research that came out of that, that Sc Scotland are radically changing and developing their current system. And as Cheryl pointed out, they've now got many more contacts and, and visits than, than we're able to do in England. And in addition to that, we're very mindful that we work alongside quite a few different lay and peer support services. So we have one particular group called Home Start, which is a charity which offers lay um, visiting, home visiting for families. And um, more often than not, they complement the health visitors' work, so they're working alongside. So it's, it's an example of where the, the health history is doing the reaching out into the community, and, and it's, that's important work because it helps engage um, families with, with other services in the community. Okay, so this is where we get to the meat of, so what does this proportionate model really look like? So just to remind you really that at the base, we have this universal care. And as Cheryl mentioned, 
It is contact for every single baby or an offer of, of, of contact for every single baby born in the UK. The very nature of it, though, the very fact that it's unsolicited is not without challenge. So in other words, a parent doesn't have to ask to get it. They get offered it. There will always be some who perhaps are a bit hesitant, and that's why we need the worker to be a skilled person, and by and large, people will say yes um, when they're offered it. Now, on top of that, uh, so as part of that universal core offer, there are the, um, the four contacts, that's in England, but more in other countries. And um, on top of that, so that's just meant to be a bare minimum. And as additional need is identified, they could move into the universal plus level. And um, if there are particularly um, long-standing challenges and difficulties, then we would refer to it as partnership plus. Now, the important thing to remember with this is that it's, it's not static. So it's not a case of saying, oh, well, this is a universal plus family, full stop, and that's it for the, for the you know, naught to four years. Um, it's about moving up and moving down because it's relationship-based, and it's, there is this continual needs assessment in partnership with the family, so that and w which is characterised by listening and matching. Um, but it might be that some difficulties are fairly long-standing. So at the partnership plus level, then it, it means then that a, a lot of the work is also done in parallel with other agencies. And what the health visitor particularly offers is that ongoing continuity. So families living very complex lives may be involved with several services, which is really hard to navigate. But the beauty of our model is that means there should be one constant, and that's the health visitor. We're also mindful that families don't live in va vacuums. In my own doctorate work, um, I looked at pathways and experiences of, of how parents engage with parenting programs in particular. So it includes the whole range of things, group programs, home visiting programs, etc. well, health, health visiting. And what was really apparent was that parents don't necessarily distinguish between services or programs. Help is help. And it's good help if it's the right help at the right time. And it's specific to them. So delivering a good service is also about being aware of those other sources of help that the family will also be able to capitalise on and will perhaps already be making use of and go to more readily. Now, I was really pleased um, listening to the plenaries this morning because they set us up quite nicely in terms of the um, explanations of uh, some of the home visiting experiences here. And... Um, the reminder of the preventative model. So where you might refer to your selected or um, indicated level of prevention, really that would sit up in the universal plus, plus and partnership plus domain of, of this model. So the big question is, can it be exported? Yes, it can. And as John has already pointed out, there's um, some work that was initiated by UNICEF and ESA, which is the International Step-by-Step -Step Organization, who brought together a good number of um, people from a range of countries. And their focus really was, was to develop systems of home visiting across Eastern Europe and, and Central Asia. So the exercises in, in those different meetings and the whole plan was to develop um, a viable model that could be translated and used perhaps in, in slightly different ways relevant to the country context. So as part of that, there was um, the necessary need to understand the systems, appraise the different systems, look at the ingredients, value what was already in place, test them out, develop packages, etc. And there are some, success, some successes in that story. Um, there's, there's actually more than listed here. Uh, Kazakhstan is one particular country that's truly embraced the universal um, proportionate model and got systems set up and ready to go. Serbia was starting from a different place. They already had patronage nurses, so they have built on and developed further what they were already doing. And then there are other country models as well. 
um, that are already in existence. But the beauty of this range of work and the efforts that UNICEF have been doing is that they have created in partnership with ESA a full set of learning modules, learning resources, so that other countries that are thinking about developing their own system of a universal proportionate approach can um, take those learning units from the web. They're all free access. So I want to finish with this. Um, I have a, a friend and a colleague who is actually working here, um, or lives here now, actually. In fact, she's an American citizen now. But uh, we were at university together in Manchester in the north of England. So she and I trained together at the same time, did our nursing degree, finished in our final year becoming health visitors. So these are her words. So I thought ultimately to get a good feel um, for what is the difference between the two, this is how she summed it up. So she says there's many similarities. It's about building a relationship and rapport as nurses. This is a key tool to affect behavior changes. The differences exist in the education requirements and the available curriculum. I now use motivational interviewing as a tool. I'm focusing on the most vulnerable populations. As a PHN in the US, we must be aware of billing and funding. In the UK, you have a universal health service. Nevertheless, it's a rewarding job on both its sides, sides of the Atlantic. So that's a fitting place for me to finish and hand over to Deborah. Thanks. Oh, that was great. It's going to move things around a little bit here. I want to thank Cheryl and Karen and, of course, John. Uh, it, it's refreshing to hear about what other people are doing and to remind ourselves none of us are the keeper of the flame, none of us have all the knowledge. And we'll only advance our thinking if we're comfortable looking over the fence and learning from others. Um, the idea of universal services here in the US is I think a time that has come for us to accept it and embrace it. And you know, we have done it in the past. The Shepherd Towner Act was passed in 1921. And it was at the turn of the last century passed to provide services, maternal health care services, pregnancy classes to everyone regardless of circumstance. It was indeed a universal program. It was hotly debated. The American Medical Association was the number one opponent of this idea in 1921. And at one of the battles, this is the quote I love best, some, someone got up and said that this legislation was an attempt to remove children from the care of their parents by turning control of the mothers of the land over to a few single ladies holding government jobs in Washington. There is so much wrong with that sentence that we don't know where to go. <laughs> These were very modest investments. Every state got a formula grant of $5,000, which would be $70,000 today. And if they were very good, they got a competitive grant to go with it. I'm sure that sounds familiar to those of you that are here representing states. There were only three states that didn't take the government up on this offer. The three states kind of surprised me. I think they'll surprise you. The state of Massachusetts, Susan Bartlett, the state of Connecticut, and the state of Illinois. Sadly, this legislation was not reestablished, and after five years, it ended. And it sadly ended our, our commitment to any sort of universal services. When maternal and child health care resurfaced in the New Deal, it was very much an idea that was going to be limited to poor parents. Because, of course, only poor parents need help caring for their children. I think this idea, though, the idea of universality, is something that is alive and well and is timely to expand here in the United States. Why do I say that? Number one, we've got a lot of models that are doing it. We've got at least. Uh, three models that I know of that are research-based and are replicating and offering their services to all newborns and parents, with at least within catchment areas. Durham Connects, which is now Family Connects, is operating in many communities around the country. Welcome Baby in Los Angeles provides services for at least nine months to newborns and their parents in, in 14 of the most targeted, stressed areas uh, within Los Angeles County. First Burst, and I know that Becky Kilburn talked about this here, 
uh, the program in New Mexico is offered without qualification to all first-time parents in that state. We have legislation pending in uh, Washington, state of Washington, the state of Oregon, to put in some sort of universal platform to support all newborns and their parents. I am very excited about this idea. It's an idea I actually talked about at the first home visiting summit back in 2008, that if we wanted to achieve the very best for kids, we had to start with a universal foundation. The other reason I'm excited about this is not just because of what we're seeing in the program side, but I think there is a cultural and contextual and policy shift in this country that is finally recognizing the importance of providing support to all parents. We're recognizing that many, many families face challenges. You know, Gilbert Steiner wrote in 1976, reflecting on what Grace Abbott had said at the turn of the last century, that all children are dependent, but only some are dependent on the state. And in describing what children would not be dependent on the state, the lucky children, Gilbert Steiner called them, this is the characteristics they had. They would be raised by their biological parents who would provide a home for them. These children would spend their preschool years and after school hours in and around their home playing in their neighborhood. They would have adequate and reasonable nutritious meals at home. Lost my kids on that one. And finally, they would be treated periodically by physicians and dentists. Hmm. Add qualifiers like stable home, safe neighborhood, and a consistent and affordable health care. And how many children today are what you would call lucky? Children that don't need any collective assistance, children that can be cared for simply by their parents themselves. You know, the child welfare response in this country has hinged on the balancing three values. We talk about child safety, we talk about child well-being, and we talk about parental autonomy. And in doing, in the way we've balanced these three core values, we've in many ways required parents to fail before we feel we're socially responsibility, we have any social responsibility to help them. Think how different that is from a medical setting. You go to the doctor and you've got some precancerous cells. He doesn't give you heavy duty chemotherapy, but neither does he tell you Go away, come back to me when you've got stage four cancer, and then have I got a program for you. He sits you down and he said, here's from a preventive perspective, this is what we can do for you. And you're free to take the prevention or not, but let me tell you where this path is going. We often are, I think, not explicit enough in saying to families, you want to be a good parent, we know you want to be a good parent, and here's the pathway to do it. We're not intruding in your life. We're giving you the tools you need to be successful. I think the concept of universality offers assistance and is attractive for several reasons. First, it builds a service delivery structure that gathers mutual individual choices and interests into a collective call for action and change. Second, it creates a response system, a service system, that's shaped by what families say they need rather than changing existing systems to, feel, to fit what agency managers think or what thought leaders like myself might think, it's elevating the voice of parents to say, tell us what you need. And our responsibility is to make that work. Third, it creates a context in which all children are assumed to be in need of our collective investments. Children are not singled out for concern because they're poor with the idea that only poor parents require help because they just can't manage things on their own. Nothing in the model, and I think Karen and Sherilyn said this well, nothing in a universal platform says everybody gets the same thing. Indeed, it's just the opposite. It's creating a framework so that families will get the very services they need and we can efficiently use the resources we have at hand. Now, some say a universal system is too costly, that if we do it, we're taking money away from those families that most need services. I would say the current system's not working very well in case anyone hasn't noticed and because we can't, to find those families, we're gonna to need to offer a universal base of support for everyone. It's very hard to be strength-based when you start from the perception of, we're here to help you because you think we've got, you've got serious problems. It's easier to be strength-based when we know that we're reaching out and helping everyone. And it contributes to a notion of recognizing that raising kids is one of the things that should bring us together. It should never divide us. 
it should never make us think that we've got competent parents here and just parents that can't handle it over there. No parent handles it on their own. It's just a difference in where we get the resources and how we use them. I've noticed in education recently, they talk less about the achievement gap and more about the opportunity gap that children face. Children don't have the ability to do school-based grade level work. We don't set the expectations high enough. We assume that if we just treat their deficits, we're gonna get good outcomes at the end. But it is about offering children an opportunity to learn that cuts across all situations. At the moment, I think many families in this country wind up in our child welfare system, not because of how they've acted, but because there's been an opportunity gap in their access to prevention. I think this universal assistance idea can help us close that opportunity gap, that it can create a much better realignment of the values of child safety, child well-being, and parental autonomy. I would like to suggest that next year at this conference, we spend some time unearthing those universal programs that are going on. And we look at them and we say to, say to ourselves, how could we build on them? How could we get better legislation so that while I will hope and pray one day we have the medical base of support you have in the UK, I'm not real optimistic at the moment, but, but even without that, let's say we keep with our fragmented dysfunctional healthcare system. Is there some way in which we can use this universal platform to begin to show the country what it means to be truly fair to all children? Thank you. All right, we have questions, questions that have been submitted on the app. Um, some of these are, let's see. Do, the, a lot of these are focused, they're, they're specific questions about the uh, health visiting system. Do the universities provide specific degrees or programs for those who wish to enter the health visitor profession? Yes, yeah, I can't say. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Do you want to say yeah. anything more about that? It, it's okay, so I used to um, teach on our program. So it's um, all, all entrants to the health visiting course have to be registered nurses or registered midwives. That's the first bottom line. Um, and uh, then they join the program. It's 52 weeks long, includes annual leave within that. And it's 50% theory, 50% practice. And it has core components within it uh, which include leadership skills, which are truly critical, research skills in terms of how to understand evidence and apply that to practice, uh, core skills, which is actually the, the, the business of being a health visitor, and which topics in, in child development, immunization, et cetera, et cetera, and safeguarding is often a large feature of that. Um, and then several uh, public health is another core topic, as is social policy. So in actual fact, we are always fighting for the numbers of topics because it, it really needs to cover so much more. And really, we would like to see a longer program than we are currently able to offer. And we'd also like to see a direct entry program. But we, we'd, we'd like to see a program yet. which is predicated on health visiting, not predicated on nursing and midwifery first. There is so, well, you all know, there's so much to learn you know, with every family. There's so much you could so much more you could do if you had more time and more education to call on. So uh, that, that's our current lobbying. A related question, have the professional standards for the health visitor role been a barrier to entry into the field? And I wonder if that might be related to, you showed a slide that showed like a drop off of health visitors. <coughs> well, I, I don't think I explained that, that slide perhaps as well as I should have done. I, I sat down and then thought I'd I could have explained that a little bit better. The point I was really trying to make there was that ultimately decisions are made politically. And um, in 2012, a decision was made politically to invest in health visitors in England. And we actually increased the number by 4,000. Over the last three years, another political decision was made to move the um, health visiting budget into the public health budget, which was fine, no problem. Um, however, then to reduce the public health budget, which wasn't fine, and we've lost all those 4,000 health visitors. Extraordinary. 
Um, and, you know, that was really my, my point about that. I think the standards are really important because this having national standards means that each family has some chance of having the same quality of service wherever they're born in the country. So I don't think our national standards get in the way. I think they enhance services. Okay. They're really important. And the standards are used to validate our educational programs as well. So they at least ensure that every program across the country has to ha cover those elements. So mm -hmm. they're a bit of a, they're a safeguard, really, in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, another workforce question. Are your health visitors compensated at an equitable rate with teachers? Mm. Yes, I think pretty much. Probably, yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. They're on a par. Yeah. <laughs> Are teachers <laughs> underpaid in the UK? Well, they're both <laughs> underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the question. Yes, that was not the question. <laughs> in, interestingly, Scotland, which is, is riding very high at the moment, absolutely on the crest of a wave, have just decided to um, compensate their health visitors one increment up from from England. Um, we have a, a sort of banding, and, it, and the banding in, in in England is band six. In Scotland, it's going to be band seven. So I think all the health visitors in the north of England are going to be moving. <laughs> <laughs> the board is away. Why not? <laughs> yeah, they have a lot more work um, to do. Here's a question. I think uh, I'm going to throw this to you, Deb. <laughs> How can the U.S. move towards a universal home visiting model when we're not even serving all the high-risk, high-need families in our country? Because we can take a step forward and there's places that are doing it. I think you start with that base. You say to yourself, in order to find the families that are most at risk right now, I think when you build it on a universal platform, when everyone knows people are being asked and invited to talk about their issues, the odds that you'll find those high-risk families, I think, go way up. And I think the odds they feel welcome and invited into a service program go up. Because it's not some, you're not ferreting them out. You're not trying to find them. You're basically saying, this is a matter of course. In, this is a community in which we care about the outcomes of all kids. And we're here to see what you need in order to do the best job you can for your children. So states are embracing it. They're thinking of adding it. We're doing it in Illinois. We've brought in Family Connect to several communities in Illinois, and when it was on the table, a lot of communities over and above our pilot study, communities are saying, let's sign up. We have to think of this as the major investment in the future of not just children, but in the real infrastructure we need to provide adequate, deep, precision-based home visiting programs going forward. I don't know how we do one without the other. Ooh, my clapping is very loud. Um, <laughs> well, I've heard a lot, not me, the question and <laughs> answer. I heard a lot about health visits after birth, but I didn't hear much about prenatal visits universally. Can you share a little bit about options for pregnant mums? Okay, well, I did talk about that a little bit. Um, we have a, a, a strong midwifery service. We have three universal services in England. We have a midwifery service, a health visiting service, and then the... Um, general practitioner, the doctors. So everybody has a full access to all of those services. So the midwife will see the mother largely during the antenatal period. And their health visitor really only comes in at around 36 weeks to do an antenatal contact. And I talked about that in terms of relationship building, um, maybe exploring what their own, the parents' experience of parenting had been and so on and what they would want for their, their child. Um, again, it's a little bit of a lobby to have two antenatal contacts. We're not there yet. I think there would be benefit in, in that. One of the problems in the UK, and I think it's the same in the US, is mothers work very late. Mm -hmm. um, so they often work till about two weeks before their, their baby's born. Um, so it might be harder to get access early, but yes, that would be the ideal um, to do more. But I think the other... Um, thing is that the relationship with the midwife and the health visitor is really important so information can pass between the two as with the, with the um, doctor as well general practitioner what is the oh this is a i think a relative relatively straightforward co uh, question what's the average caseload of a health visitor <laughs> 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 well the institute okay. of health visiting does a survey on that every year and when we were at, at the top of that peak um, the caseloads had come down to an average of about 350 to 400 children. 
and I know you're, you know, you're a lot of you operating very specialist programs, so you have a much smaller caseload. Um, the ideal is about 250 with less with very vulnerable communities. You know, if you've got a very, really vulnerable community, then, then, then obviously less. Um, unfortunately, in England now, the caseloads have gone up um, dramatically, and I think something like 22% have got between, 28% have got between um, 500 and 1,000 children. A lot of that's in cities, where particularly with sort of mobile population. Northern Ireland, I know, are working towards uh, an average of 180. Um, so these numbers are probably higher. But what you've got to remember is it's a universal service. So some families don't have a huge amount of needs. They get the routine developmental checks, reviews of the mother's mental health, and so on, whereas other families will get many more contacts um, because they have much greater needs. Yeah. And I think it's probably fair to say as well that the numbers are unusually high at the moment, but that of course our workforce numbers have gone down. Yeah. So if the workforce numbers go down, the numbers of the caseload will go up because of course mm -hmm. the birth rate hasn't changed. Yeah. And so it's gone up. <laughs> yeah. What percentage of families accept a health visit and then what percentage of families uh, have the, get all five of the minimum visits? Okay, so probably, did it, did it, did it, did it, yeah, it's probably 99.5 families mm -hmm. present accept the service um, because it is non-stigmatizing. It is part of, you know, you have the midwife, you have the health visitor. If we were called social workers, then perhaps, you know, we wouldn't be accepted in the same way. Um, but certainly as health visitors, it's, it's something which is very acceptable. Um, the other part was how, what percent then get all five of them? Okay, the in terms of five contacts, okay. So these five contacts are mandated and statistics have to be sent in to government to monitor that. Um, what's happened because of the reduction in public health budgets is there's been a certain amount of what I would call jiggery pokery going on. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I've been sitting here realizing that this presentation is being beamed out across the world, so I hope there aren't <laughs> too many in government listening to me, but I've said it to them personally, too. Um, have you used those words exactly? I have. Okay. <laughs> it's a technical term. It's a technical term. <laughs> and some of the jiggery pokery might be to make contact antenatally, um, not, not a health visitor, but, but to send a letter <laughs> and say, would you like any information to come back to us? Um, the other thing is that health visitors work with a team, and although it should be a health visitor doing all five contacts, um, we know that 65% of families um, see a nursery nurse, a children, not, she's, I mean, she won't be a nurse, um, somebody we call a nursery nurse, but very, very capable. They're trained children's workers in child development, and they do the reviews at eight months, and um, they also do the reviews at two and a half months, two and a half years very often. Um, and I think it's something like 75% of families don't see a health visitor at two and a half. So the 25% who do will be those vulnerable families. Um, yeah. And because of the pressure on budgets, unfortunately, they've had to, de have to delegate more. Um, but this is being addressed at the moment, and the hope is to pull it back so that it's five done by a health visitor. Ah, and needless to say, in Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales, <laughs> they're all done by a health visitor. <laughs> um, let's see, we have, I think we've gone through. The Duchess of Cambridge has expressed an interest in early childhood interventions. Has she supported health visiting? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. We understand she does support health visiting. We have had meetings with the Royal Foundation. She is very committed to um, supporting outcomes for the youngest, the most vulnerable members of society, which is fantastic. She's publicly said she wants to make it her life's work, which is just amazing. She's very, very interested, as you know, all the young lawyers are very interested in mental health. Um, so, yes, I think you know it's fair to say that we've been invited to Royal Foundation meetings, so yes, she does support health visiting. Um, for Deb. When you speak of universal home visiting, do you envision a new model or utilizing existing models? Um, I envision communities adopting a model that's gonna work best for them, and they have some choices ahead of them. Uh, and I think in some communities, a single visit linkages then to a lot of other service programs will be good. 
Other communities may want to adopt a program that allows some uni universal contact with families for a longer period of time. I think that would work. I think right now we're not at a point where we have a single monolithic program we can put forward. I think we're still in the experimental stage. So I would like to lift up communities to do some experimenting drawing on the models we have because there's good research to talk about the quality of the visitors. All right. On that note, I think we will end our plenary. Thank you very much. You made it all the way to the end.